thank you everyone for coming for the Open Source Summit around uh, talking about BuildKit. We'll have uh, three presenters today. Uh, Tony Stigi from, from Docker, uh, Matt Rickard from Google, and uh, Akihiro Suda from NTT. Uh, so please give them a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Tibor. So I'm going to start with uh, the first talk titled uh, Getting Most Out of BuildKit. So I'm going to cover a lot of BuildKit features that you might find useful in your projects and explain you how you could use them uh, to improve your build flow. So lots of uh, new stuff in here. Lots of, I'm going to mention all the old stuff as well. So there should be lots of things that you can try out later on your own. Uh, so, but first of all, let's uh, make sure that everything, uh, everyone understands exactly like what this bulky thing is and, and what it is not. So in Docker, we try to give you great tools so that you can build, ship, and run your applications. And what BuildKit is, it's the lower level component that's powering the build part of it. So, and in, uh, in Docker, when we talk about building things, we usually build things from Docker file with Docker build. So this is how it used to look like without BuildKit. And with BuildKit, the same command, uh, you see all the parallelization and, and uh, fancy output uh, stuff is there. So a little bit of the timeline and, and history of, of this feature. So we first added BuildKit uh, as an experimental feature like 10 months ago in the 1806 release. Yeah, it was experimental, but already like quite useful. Then in the next release, we uh, took it out of experimental, but left it opt-in with the environment variable, added some new features like uh, build secrets, SSH mounts, stuff like that. And now we're in the beta release of another beta of, uh, time of the other release. And uh, in this release, it's, uh, again, we have lots of new features. It's opt-in, uh, and we have this new build X thing. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's opt-in. So how do you opt-in? It's very simple. You set this environment variable. It completely just switches your, your Docker build over to using BuildKit. Should be very simple. And one note is that. Uh, while it's opt-in, it's not opt-in because we think that it's, uh, it isn't stable enough or something like that. It's definitely like safe to use. Why it's opt-in is mostly because uh, we are still working on the Windows container support that we want to get in. But if you're not using Windows containers, then it should be like very safe for you to use in, in your current projects. So these were the, some Docker releases, but uh, BuildKit itself is not only like an internal hidden component uh, inside Docker. It's an open source project managed by community under Mobi. So there's lots of other use cases for it as well. You might be aware of the IMG builder that's also based on BuildKit. Uh, if you use Knative, you can, you can use uh, BuildKit templates there. And we also do uh, like a standalone BuildKit releases. Uh, so these are not time-based releases. These are, we just make them when when we have some uh, cool new features. So we had one in, in March, and we just had one last week uh, where we added some cool stuff like security entitlements. So that was a brief overview of the project. Let's get back to the topic and see how we can, use, uh, how we can improve your project and make sure you take advantage of all the improvements that uh, BuildKit makes. So the first part. Uh, of it is that it's uh, actually you can get a lot of it automatically without doing anything. You just uh, opt in to build it, and you can use it with your own old Docker files. We're compatible with all the all the old Docker files. You should just see improvements right away, like with uh, with the better caching or or uh, from the dependency resolution, and and you maybe even see a little bit concurrency in your in your current Docker files. But what you, one of the things that uh, you really want to do is you want to use multi-stage builds. So multi-stage builds was something that we added uh, uh, like in, in 17.5 release, yes. Um, so this is like long before BuildKit. It's like more than a year before BuildKit. Uh, but uh, multi-stage builds is greatly improved when you use uh, BuildKit. So 
when you're using multi-stage builds, then you can really take advantage of all the concurrency. So BuildKit can, uh, can parallelize your stages and all the dependency resolution. And uh, so you can target different, you can uh, build different targets from a multi-stage builds and BuildKit will figure out all the things that it can just skip over and, uh, and uh, it's much faster that way. So if you're not that familiar, familiar with multi-stage builds yet, I recommend this blog post, sorry. And uh, if you didn't see Docker file best practices talk, then you can check it out from the, from the video. Another the improvement that was added to multi-stage builds in 1806, and uh, this is like the build kit only feature now, is uh, run dashes mount. So this is, this is how you can create mount points directly in the Docker file. And this, is, this feature is very similar to multi-stage builds, but uh, when, when you use multi-stage builds, the way you connect uh, two stages with another is that you copy files from one stage to, an, to another. And uh, run dash mount is very similar. Uh, it's just that you don't need to actually duplicate any files or copy files over. You can just directly link them. So it's much more optimized that way. It doesn't create uh, like uh, duplicates of your data anywhere. There's also a bunch of special mount types. Um, probably most interesting is the cache mount type, uh, what allows you to uh, take advantage of the cache impl caching implementation that's inside your application that you're building inside Dockerfile. So for example, like your compiler uh, probably has some caching implemented in there, like, like Go compiler or, or Maven or whatever. And you can just start to take advantage of that caching uh, straight in the Docker file. It also applies uh, to all the package managers and, and uh, things like that, where you, where you, when you're doing a secondary build, Docker, even in the Docker file, even this, in this portable environment, you can still access the application-specific cache uh, uh, for your repeated builds. So this, the, this is something that can, can like really like improve your build times maybe like 10 times. So it, it can like completely change your workflow if you, if you start using this uh, daily. And if you're moving on like uh, to the 1809 release, the main thing we added there was uh, the, the build kit, true build kit, we could expose uh, build secrets and SSH forwarding. So this is obviously very useful when you're when you want to use some uh, hidden credentials in your in part of your build or build from private repositories. And um, uh, we just want to make it very easy to use and we also want to make it, uh, make sure that it's always really secure so that there's, n there's never a chance how you can leak your credentials into your final image and, and expose, him, or expose them to some like hidden mechanism. So again, like if you're not, if you want to learn more about this, uh, there's a blog post and, and uh, talk in, in, the, in the last uh, DockerCon EU. So now we are up, uh, we're gonna discuss the new features. So new features in, uh, in 1903. And the first one I want to mention is something we call custom outputs. And what this allows you to do is uh, basically bring the, uh, the power of Docker files beyond just images. So what we like about Docker files is that uh, you, you, uh, you clone a project, you see there's a Docker file and you can easily build it into, into, build this application into a container image and just run it in a container. It always works and it's very simple. But when you're working with projects, then you very often need some other artifacts as part of your, your build process. Like you may need access to you need, may need to like generate some artifacts, generate some code. Uh, maybe you want to get access to the binary locally. And uh, so for example, in this project, I'm running make binaries and it just like gives me a ton of errors for software that I need to install on my local system. Like this is kind of an error that I would never see when I'm running Docker build. So can we just uh, make all those use cases work as well through, through Docker build? And this is not like, very, very new thing because we've been seeing our users using this uh, all the time and we use this uh, capability in our, in our projects all the time as well. But 
at the moment, if you want to do something like this, then usually you will follow this pattern where you just build like a temporary image, then create a container out of it, then find a file inside that container and then clean up after yourself. Like it's, it's quite painful to, to use. So in uh, in new Docker build, there's a new flag that's just output. Uh, and that basically allows it to configure what you can do with the build result. So a build result does not need to become an image. You can just uh, you can provide uh, very, various like configuration, different configurations there. And in here, what we do, we just provide an output directory, or we pipe it to a tar, and this is how we get access to the files right away. And I can just quickly show you this in a, in an uh, like like a real world case how you how you could use this. So in here I have a Go application. Uh, it's just like a simple Go application with uh, just printing some object types. And there's a Docker file in here. So I can just build this. And uh, it, will, it will try to compile this and pull the dependencies and, and build an image. Now I can run the application with a container. Everything is simple like, like we expect. Uh, but now let's try to actually work with this project. So let me make one modification. Let me, uh, let me add this uh, new keyword in here in this object type. And how this project is modeled is that it uses uh, protocol buffers for the, for the actual data types. So, so by doing it this way, uh, those object definitions could be potentially used in other languages as well. So when I expose this key, I need to change the, the protocol buffer file as well. And let me add the same key in here. And now when I try to just build this application, it will not work because I, I do not have the, the generated code from the protobuf. So in protobuf, we only define, define the actual, like the data type, and then we generate the, the code for one specific language. And uh, usually, so if, you are, if I look at the files, then this is the proto file, and this is the file that is supposed to be generated. So how can we generate this file? Like, let's see if there's something in the readme, like the authors uh, say that this should maybe run go generate or maybe this command, and, and it did work on their machine. So, so let's try this go generate, but I don't have go in here. So let's try the product. Don't have product either. So maybe I can install it. Doesn't even have a package. So, so and, and I have no idea what versions should I use and things like that. So, but let's find a solution to this problem. And in here, I also have another Docker file. And that Docker file is for generating protobuf. It's not for, gener not for compiling your application. It's just for generating your protobuf. And if I open this proto file, you see that this defines all the versions that you need for Golang and protocol uh, uh, compiler and, and the generator. And you see that this is like really complex. Like I really wouldn't want to run those commands in my machine. And with this Docker file, I can just run docker build dash f proto docker file, this one. And I specifying an output. So I want the output of that build to be written into my local directory because this is where my source code is and I'm building from my source code as well. So now it builds using this protocol buffers file. See that it uh, did run the generate command in here in the specific context. And in the end, it, uh, the build end that's not with creating an image, but by exporting files to the client. So now if I do git, uh, sorry, uh, git, uh, status. So then I see that uh, there is a, there's a new file generated in here that was generated by the, by the Docker build. And now if I do the regular Docker build with this modification, it works because the, because the generated code uh, was also updated. And uh, I can just use this in here as well. I can just do like uh, the show out and I can just maybe write this binary directly to my file system. And now, now in this out folder, I have the whole my application and I can just run it directly. And, uh, and it works this way as well. So there's lots of use cases where you can, where you can use this technique now. So to recap, uh, that's just output. 
uh, allows you to use uh, Docker build for all the artifacts available build process. And can, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you can also check out uh, uh, Michael Crosby's project TerraOS, where he uses like a technique like this to build kernels and to build full machines from from uh, Docker files, only from Docker files, and similarly just like uh, exports the, the build artifacts out in the end. Um, another new feature is uh, remote cache. So in Docker builds, uh, we one of the great things about Docker build is that it has really good caching. So when you change, when you build and you change your code, we only uh, run the commands that actually would need to be run because your your source code make, makes the, we can detect that your source code will have a different result on that uh, on that command. So this is all go good, and this is what gives us fast builds. But what if you're running this second build in a machine that doesn't have your previous state? So this is very common in the CI, for example. So for that case, we have a cache from flag now, and you can just point it to an external cache resource, and we will use the cache from that re resource in, for this particular build. And one of the things that we can put there is, is an image that you, that you have just built. And a little bit of history again, that's, uh, we used to have something like cache from before as well. Maybe you're familiar with it. Uh, not to be confused with that one because that one had like really, really bad issues. It didn't support multi-stage builds. All images need to be pre-pulled and it did some like really weird JSON comparison where, where it just broke down in some edge cases. So in, in the new cache from uh, powered by BuildKit, we have fixed all those issues so that uh, um, we export the metadata for all of your builds. So all of the intermediate build stages as well, your, your whole, the whole build and uh, the cache is pulled down automatically. You don't need to pre-pull it and we only pull it when you, we actually get the match. We don't pull anything that, that is discarded later. And let's see that one in action as well. So I'm back in this same project uh, where I was before. Let's get rid of this overlay. Uh, and I can do docker build dot in here because I just built it before. It's already, all already cached. So let's give this a name first uh, demo and now I want to not only build this, but I want to also make sure that the cache metadata is exported in this image when it's, when it's created. And for that one, I need to opt in, and I do this with a build argument that's uh, Docker build kit inline cache. And when I built this with this variable, then again, everything was cached. Uh, but in the end, you see that there is uh, something called exporting cache in here. So this is, this is the phase where it actually wrote all the cache metadata into the image as well. And now what I can do is I can just push this image uh, demo. So it will push the image that I just built. And after it has finished pushing to the hub, I can, uh, I can just completely wipe this machine, for example. So I could docker system prune that shape for to clear out everything, all the data that I have in, my, in this, uh, that docker has in this machine. So I run system TF and I see that there is nothing in here. Um, so now if I would run this build again, it would start pulling this big Golang image. I don't want to do that. I want to be more efficient. So let's prune this again. And uh, what I want to do instead is I want to build and I'm providing this cache from flag. And I'm just pointing to the same image that I just built. So, so this demo image and I'm building it now. And you will see that it finished in like two seconds. It, uh, what it does, all the steps were cached. Even, this, even the step where it does like go build in here was cached. Although I, I don't even have a Go compiler in this machine. I, I didn't have any, I didn't repool the Golang image, for example. But because we track the metadata across the stages, we can still figure out that your source code is still valid for this binary. And, uh, and uh, in the end, we see that to actually get access to this, to this cached information, we need to we need to pull those two layers. We pull those in, and and that's why we got like a really fast build result. 
And of course, this is not valid for all the cases. Like, you do make changes to your source code. Like, you don't always get like full cache for from your previous builds. So, you can try that one as well. So, let me clean clean up everything again, and let me do some kind of modification in this Docker file. For example, like instead of doing license in here, let's do let's do license two. So, so this definitely needs to needs to give some different results from the from the image that I built previously. So now if I'm building again with cache from, you will see that I still didn't need to pull in the Golang image. The binary part was still cached because changing this license file didn't affect the binary at all. Uh, we pulled in one layer, and then we actually executed this copy command again. And, and the build is still two seconds. So still, uh, still we save lots of trees with this. OK, so th those were the two new features and, and just the important features that you need to know from Docker build. But what if you really want to get like, uh, like absolutely all features that we are developing in the, in the build kit repository and use this in your project? So if you remember in the early on, I, had, uh, I showed the Docker versions with build kit support. And I also showed some build kit uh, standalone, feature, standalone measures, like this uh, 0.5 release. So you might think, like, what's the difference between those two? And uh, the short answer is that there is not a lot different between them. Like, they are all, they're basically from the same code base. They all support the same solver, same ca cache mechanism, uh, same front end supports, things like this. Uh, one big difference, though, is that. Uh, they are backed by a different storage engine. So Docker uses uh, Mobi storage mechanisms that we have in Docker engine, and, but BuildKit was built on top of ContainerD storage already. And because of this difference, there is like a small set of features that we can only provide on the ContainerD storage. So this involves like multi-stage uh, uh, images and, um, and uh, support for OCI formats and things like that. And uh, Docker Engine is in the progress of moving to the container storage as well. So, uh, like, you can go to the container summit after this one and ask hard questions from them, like when it, this is arriving. Uh, so, with this in mind, like, uh, uh, you might have a question, like, which one should you use? Like, should you use the Docker Docker one with that has like nice user experience? You're all familiar with this one, or maybe if you want to get uh, really, all of the features. Maybe you should look at this much low, much more low level, lower level tool, BuildKit, instead, and use use this uh, as like a standalone uh, uh, binary to to do your builds. And maybe you can just do. Maybe you can just get like best of both worlds. So this is why we get to the build expert. So if you you should have seen some glimpses of buildx already, it might be wondering what it really is. So let's get it uh, clear now. So BuildX is a, is a CLI plugin for Docker. So it is a, it's a separate binary from the Docker binary, but it has a subcommand in the Docker command. So, you, so there's a new, if you add this binary, you will get a command like Docker BuildX, and it will provide you lots of new build functionality. And what functionality it provides is that it uh, provides you the same, very similar build UI that you have it from Docker. So there's a build command that it takes all the same flags that you are familiar with Docker. It has some extra flags, though. And uh, it, behind the scenes, it's like 100% uh, upstream build kit. The, it can use the uh, build kit uh, the binary that we release from the Mobi upstream directly. And you get absolutely all the features all the time. Uh, so we didn't just stop in, in the, for like adding compatibility for different stuff. We also wanted to add some more use cases that our users have been asking for us. And so it also has some new things like uh, multi-node support. And we want to be flexible and provide like different variants of build, build X that you can use uh, for different use cases. Uh, so let's cover this multi-node thing. Um, Basically, the multi-node thing in BuildX means that uh, you can, BuildX allows you to create new instances of Builder. 
So you don't just have like one build endpoint that shares cache with all the other components. You can create uh, namespaced uh, instances that are scoped to that are scoped and will not interfere with any other one. And you can also use those instances to work with your remote nodes. And if you're working with your remote nodes, then you can also add multiple nodes to the single builder instance. So you can basically like set up almost like a build farm that you have your uh, builder instance that's, that has some specific name and it's actually backed by multiple nodes that maybe, maybe one node is uh, ARM64, like an actual ARM64 node in the cloud and the other one is, is an x86 node. And there's a build use command that you can use to switch between different, different, uh, different builders. So you can set one as a, as a current builder and then all the build commands will, will, uh, will go to this, uh, this instance. And you can see that it's somewhat similar to Docker Context if you're, if you're familiar with Docker Context and it actually tightly integrates with Docker Context. So you, you can like use the contexts directly with, uh, with build use as well. Uh, when we say that uh, we're trying to be like flexible and provide multiple variants, what this means is that uh, in BuildX we have a concept called the driver. Uh, and basically what the driver is, is the way how BuildX connects to the actual build kit uh, functionality. And at the moment we provide uh, two drivers. Uh, one is Docker, the other is Docker container. So Docker is the, is the one you saw on the left before. So this is, uh, this is when you use the embedded library that's like hard-coded into the Docker D uh, uh, engine. And to use BuildX, you need to use the upgraded one. Uh, the other one is, uh, is the Docker container driver, where we actually just launch uh, an upstream build kit the daemon into a Docker container behind the scenes and with all the same UX. And then you get access to, to all the build kit uh, features and what's cool about this as well is that you can basically use this with any Docker version. So if you, you can run this against like a really old Docker version or when we add new cool stuff, like you, if, if upgrading a Docker engine is, is a problem for you, then you don't need to do that. You can just pick up the features automatically. Um, in the future, what you might expect is that um, like it would be nice to add a Kubernetes driver so we can just point it to a Kubernetes cluster and, and uh, make work exactly the same way as the Docker container does at the moment. Uh, we also want to just provide an image that you can, to, you can run with Docker build and uh, that will provide an image, uh, that will provide a build inside the container that uh, has the same UX that, that uh, all the Docker build tools have and, uh, and just is like namespaced into, the, into this container. So just a, like, little bit of idea what, what it looks like. There's a bunch of new commands. Uh, what you're mostly interested in is the build command in here. That's the same, that's a similar command to the current Docker build. But there's, like I said, there's lots of tools for managing the builder instances. For example, you can create one, then you can list your current ones, you can stop them and remove them after you're done. So you don't need to, for example, mess with uh, Docker in Docker. You can just create a new instance that's already scoped and after you're done, you just uh, clean it up. So uh, then we we'll reach to the section about multi-platform images. We've already heard a little bit about that, so let me explain this uh, one more time. So in Docker Build now we have uh, we have a touchless platform flag that you can uh, use to set the target platform for your specific uh, build that doesn't need to be the same platform that you're currently building on. And this uh, this version of the platform flag is is uh, available in Docker uh, 1903 as well. You don't actually need even BuildX for that. It's, uh, it's supported by the by regular Docker build. Uh, but what BuildX can do on top of that is that with BuildX you can also specify multiple of them right in, in one single build. And we will make up an image that will, that will work on both of those architectures. So this multi-platform image is like uh, what's happening when you're running this this weird build that, uh, that's actually for multiple architectures. So what we're doing is we're taking your Docker file and we're actually building this Docker file uh, for each of the platforms. So uh, we're building one, one time for, uh, for x86 and one time for ARM, for example. 
and then after both of them have, have finished, um, the, they are joined together into the multi-platform image or, or a manifest list. And uh, the builder can just push it all to registry as well for you. And then uh, once you're uh, running in your like, multi-platform cluster or, or just like once your users pull down this image, they only pull down the, the one sub image from there that's specific to their platform. And that's automatically chosen like with all the current Docker releases and, and in Kubernetes as well. So, but how does it work? Like, uh, how, this, how does it, this uh, even possible? Like, like, how can you build uh, like binary bits from, from one architecture in other bits and, or in a, another platform? So then um, there's actually like uh, different variants uh, and different versions that you could use to achieve this. Uh, one is to, one is the, one version that we support is uh, QMU. So this is probably like the easiest solution that you can do if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, it doesn't require any changes to your Docker file. We automatically, uh, automatically detect if you already have support for this in the kernel. And if you're using uh, like Docker desktop, then uh, all the Docker desktop releases come pre-configured. So they already have uh, QMU configured properly and they can build uh, for ARM and, and ARM64 as well. And I think we also like maintain some patches for the in the, in the desktop release for for some like language edge cases that uh, that we to make them work. Um, then the second version, how you can do this is uh, when you want to get uh, some some more portability and maybe some more uh, performance out of the builds, is that you can use actual uh, multiple actual nodes that are actually specific nodes for this architecture. And you can build against both of them with a single command. So in this case, like a little bit I showed before, you would run uh, build x create, you would like create a new builder instance, and with the dashes append uh, uh, flag, you can add more nodes to it. So now when you're doing a Docker build, what buildx will do is it will uh, split up your workload. For example, you're building for two architectures, but it will, it will send the same request to two nodes, but uh, one will get uh, the request with, for one architecture and the other will get the request for, for the one that uh, it supports. And so the both nodes will build the, this uh, request in parallel. When they're finished, they can both push it directly to a registry and uh, the builder will finish it up by, by just pushing the manifest list and, and joining, the, joining the bits together so, it's, uh, so it can be found by everyone. And the third version that we support that's actually quite interesting is the, when you would want to do cross compilation. So depending on your project, like your language that you're using might have like really good support for cross compilation. And in this case, like the, this is really, really like performant and powerful option. And we also make it like really easy uh, for, uh, for you to capture the actual configuration of your current build from the Docker file. So this makes it very easy to load different uh, cross-compilation tool chains inside the Docker file. For example, you can just have like a base image that can automatically configure itself against the platform flag that was passed by the user. So you use this base image and you just invoke your compiler and it's automatically configured for the, for the target ar architecture that's uh, required for the current build. And if you're interested about this thing, there's this repository where there's some examples of, of base images for like uh, uh, C and Go and, and some other languages where, where you, if you just use those base images, basically the compiler will automatically change the target architecture under the hood. And what's cool about uh, cross compilation as well is that uh, like all the things that's happening and how this actual cross compilation is implemented is handled by the by the definition in your Docker file. So BuildKit doesn't really like need to ha have any hard code or the understanding of what's going on. And what that means is, for example, that even though we don't support Windows containers yet for in, in BuildKit, you can actually build, in some cases, Windows containers on Linux now by just uh, cross compiling them. And we also have like, a demo where we, where we just uh, we, without upgrading, without doing any upgrades to, to build kit or Docker, we can just uh, like 
build the WebAssembly applications right in right the uh, same way as we right next to the Linux applications, for example. So you can just specify a platform uh, wasn't in here, and uh, we will build an image that that's a multi-platform image that has binary bits for running Linux containers and maybe also running a WebAssembly binary. So this is like uh, completely customizable from the user. Uh, so let's give you a, like a quick demo of what you can expect in this in this buildx thing. Uh, so first of all, you have Docker and and you have a buildx command in here. You see that there's a bunch of new commands in here. So the most important one is the build one. If I do build dash dash help, you see that these are mostly all the same flags that that you have in regular Docker build. But there's some extra flags though. For example, like I covered cache from in, in this talk that's in regular Docker build as well. But in buildx, you also have cache too that you can use for, for some even fancier uh, cache exporting. And, for example, for exporting the, the actual layers of your, of your uh, intermediate build stages and things like that, and exporting cache locally into files and, and, uh, and quite cool stuff. Um, so I can just do docker build x build in here. And, uh, and you can see it's, uh, it's all the same as, as docker build. It builds, builds an image for you. Uh, if I do... Uh, let me see if I do docker build x ls, I will see all the different builders that I have configured in this system. So what you see in here is, first of all, if you start this up, you will see this default builder. So this is, this is the default that's always set up. And, uh, and, uh, and, but I have some other ones in here as well. For example, like I have, I have something that I call remote build and that that builder actually has two nodes under it. One is the AMD64 node, the other is ARM64 node. And uh, so you can also see that the platforms that it supports and the ARM64 supports the other ARM platforms as well. So for example, let's switch to this remote builder real quickly. Let's do a Docker build X use remote build. So now my Docker builds run against those two remote machines and I can do Docker build uh, First of all, let's show this, what's in this Docker file. So it's just a very simple Docker file, just like, uh, it's just like building some packages. And uh, I can do Docker build x build, uh, let's do platform, and let's do Linux, AMD64, and Linux ARM64. Let's give it a name. Uh, and let's push it right away as well. And I didn't do anything, and I need to do dot in here. So what's happening now under the hood is that it actually sent two build requests to two different machines. You, both of those machines built this in parallel. Like you can see the ARM commands in here and the AMD64 commands in here. I did run it before, so it's cached. Uh, then the images were pushed to the registry, so both of them exported the manifest list. and. Uh, and both of them pushed it up. And then in the end, we just merged them together. So, uh, and let's do one other case in here. Let's look at the cross compilation as well quickly. So this is the source code for the Cheers app that you might have seen during the DockerCon party. Uh, so this, uh, this is a Go application, just like a, with some pretty output. Uh, uh, if I look at this Docker file in here, then this Docker file is, uh, is using uh, cross compilation, so I don't need any support for executing ARM or anything like that if I want to build ARM images, for example. And the way it works is that in this line in here, it, uh, it sets the variables that the Go compiler ex expects from those arguments that are automatically provided by, by Docker build. And you don't even need to do this, you could just use uh, like a correct base image that does this automatically, just uh, like that demo will be like too magical otherwise. Uh, so I, so I did, made it like a little bit more explicit in here. Uh, and in the end, like let's say we want to build this for Windows as well. So for that case, we do need like a little bit of exception in here because Windows images can't run from scratch. So they can't just, uh, we, I can't just use the binary directly and export it. I need to, for Windows, I need to boot it on top of Nano server and I, nah, Windows thing I need to, at the .exe in the, in, the, in the binary name as well. So 
if I want to build this one, let's do um, uh, the uh, build x build um, platform. Let's build it for the Linux one. Let's build it for the ARM, ARM one, and let's for, let's add Windows in this mix as well. And let's give it a name. More whatever. And let's push it right away as well. And I, again, I forgot the dot. So so in in here you can see the the. The build taking place like it's uh, it's it's building. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess I forgot to pull cache for this one, so this will will take a bit of time. But in the in the end, it will give you the an image that's uh, that's uh, that has all those uh, three platforms inside there. It's all built in in Linux only. So let's see if we can wait for this to finish, or I will just show the earlier result when I when I when I built this. Oh yeah. The the reason why I didn't get the cache is that I forget to switch to the to other builder but but it does doesn't matter. It's uh it works on it worked uh, that's that's like the power of cross compilation because it basically works on any any instance. So th this is how we have an uh, image for three platforms now. Yeah, uh, let's see. And I have one more thing that I get to cover uh, before. Uh, so one extra thing that's, uh, that uh, we are kind of like missing from our, um, from our build tools is that uh, if you look at Docker build or you look at uh, what uh, BuildKit is doing, then it's solving like a very specific problem. It's taking your source code and it's converting it into a build result by being like portable and without having any side effects. But when you're actually managing your projects, you usually you're using something much, a little bit like higher level, like you're like uh, in a bare minimum, you are maybe using like a shell script to invoke your Docker build. If you're using something like, uh, like make to, to make the calls to Docker build. Uh, it's, that's the absolutely fine thing to do, of course. Uh, what's like a little bit uh, worrisome there is that if you look at well, like the BuildKit architecture, for example, then those tools often can't uh, take advantage of all the all the features that BuildKit supports, all the parallelization that it could do in, in lots of different levels. So, we're well, thinking about uh, uh, providing something that uh, that will let you well, to do like a more powerful make, for example, the, with BuildKit and and what we call it is basically make with uh, with build. So it's called Bake. And uh, what uh, what Bake does is that it's uh, another build command that you find under BuildX. Uh, it's much more higher level. It's uh, it's basically a wrapper around uh, around the regular build command, and it can build uh, project specific targets for you with uh, with a pre configured options. So all of the options that I need to type in in this demos in here, like I could just put them into the file, and I have like a like some kind of a name like a release. And I can just do a big release, and it will run with all those options without me remembering where to where to use the right flag. And same for, for example, for the cache from, you could just uh, make sure that uh, you usually have some specific location where you take the cache from a specific build. You can just define this in a in a in the file, and it's all highly parallelized by BuildKit. So you it parallelizes all your services, all your Docker files, all your platforms. Everything is uh, taken care of by, of, uh, by BuildKit, and so one thing that it can do is it can just take your compose file and it can just build it uh, like a compose build task, but with full BuildKit, with full BuildKit parallelization, and and uh, and like what I've been told is like uh, way way faster. Uh, uh, but we also support uh, some uh, a little bit of different uh, format that's uh, currently ACL and, or JSON. And this allows you to define like a custom build targets with all of the options that are supported by Docker build. And you can do some fancy things like grouping targets and, and inheriting uh, from targets from, from code reuse. So like just some, to give some example of things you might expect is that you will just run build and it will keep, uh, for your default build that will build all your services 
then maybe you will do a release build that has a little bit different options. You can run tests and, and, uh, and validations and stuff like this. These are all defined by your projects, for specific for what your project is doing. And uh, just uh, like all this bake part is, is very, it's very in the very beginning phase. We're just getting started with this. We just added this so that you can play with it as well and give us feedback. So if you're interested in this, we're like really, really interested in where we can take this design. Okay, that's that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, um, make sure you enable build kit. It's very simple. Just enable the environment variable. Uh, you can check out uh, buildx and, and bake from this repository. Uh, Everything I showed you is in the either like the Docker desktop page build, or you can get it from the from the GitHub or from the nightly Linux builds. Like you uh, don't need to wait for like a beta sign up or anything. You can just get it now. Uh, again, like uh, if you have issues, report them in the repository. We're also in the Docker community Slack in the build kit channel. If you have any questions and problems, thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Tonis. Do you think we should give questions now or, or uh, move on with the other talks and uh, do all the questions at the end? Um, do it either way, but I guess we can just have the talks now. The talks? Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Tonis. Uh, the next speaker is Matt Rickard from Google, and he's going to talk about uh, custom front ends for BuildKit. And they built one at Google, and he's going to present that one. Yeah, the old one. So yeah, by the way, uh, at the end of the three talks, we'll, we'll have more time for uh, casual conversations and questions. Uh, so if, if you have one, write them down now, and uh, feel free to ask them at the end. Thank you very much. Give it up to Matt. Thank you. Hey guys, sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, I'm Matt Rickard. I work at Google. I am a software engineer. I work on, uh, well, previously I was working on Kubernetes and GKE and, and all that, and now I'm just working on some other kind of open source uh, projects related to containers. Um, but I'm here today to talk to you about implementing alternative front ends with BuildKit. Um, and you might ask, what are front ends? Why would I want alternatives? Um, you will find the answer to that in this presentation. Um, and not only that, but I'll try to motivate how we got here. Um, and, and kind of that might help understand what's next. Um, so before that, kind of understanding like building software for building software, right? This is, it's, it's a little different from building your kind of typical uh, product-oriented software. I mean, this software is really for the developer. It's for um, building software quicker and, and faster. Um, and when I'm thinking about uh, uh, designing this kind of software, I, I try to think of um, three different things. Um, the first being composability, uh, because I mean, pr practically, like, we're not going to get it right the first time. Um, but the space moves so quickly that the, um, we're, we're always aiming at a moving target. Um, so we need to be able to implement kind of incremental changes uh, without changing the whole design. The second uh, being speed, because, I mean, we, we saw that we, our, our build artifacts get larger, our dependencies get larger, our builds become slower. So we need to speed that up um, through caching, optimization, and our, uh, our platform tools. And the final one being code sharing, and, and this one comes from, from a practical standpoint of uh, the fact that, and I've been part of this problem, we have a lot of tools, especially in the container ecosystem, that all do very similar things, um, and uh, they don't share code. And that's, that's a huge problem from a, um, a user standpoint because you get slightly different behaviors. But it's also a problem from um, the maintainer standpoint um, in that we, we can't move as fast. We can't implement things as quickly. Um, and th the idea is that monolithic architectures, and, and here I guess I mean 
more, more rigid architectures, not like monolith versus uh, um, uh, distributed or monolith versus microservices, but monolithic in, in the sense that it's rigid, that we can't change things very quickly. Um, and if we can't do that, we can't take advantage of all these new features. I mean, we just saw a ton of new features in BuildKit, and, and I'm sure you've seen other, others at DockerCon. Um, when we have that rigid architecture, we can't take advantage of those. So otherwise, we're left with legacy tools, slow builds, and kind of reinventing the wheel again. And so when I'm, when I'm thinking about this, I always think, OK, so we have Docker, we have containers, right? Um, but what, what was kind of the original um, tool for building software? And I think back to this book. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. It's known as the Dragon Book. Um, it's compilers, uh, something principles, techniques, and tools. Um, no, this is not like the next Game of Thrones episode. It's, it's not related. Um, very stylistic cover, though. Um, but this book talks about the, the design of compilers, the architecture. It takes you through like writing a sample one and all of that. And, and, and here's, here's basically a, a one slide summary of the entire book. So the most popular design for compilers is um, the, the traditional kind of static compiler is a three-phase design. So the first is the front end. So the front end is responsible for lexical analysis, um, syntactical analysis, error checking, um, parsing the source code into an AST, an abstract syntax tree, um, and generating this kind of intermediate representation of the code. Um, then the second phase is the optimizer. So the optimizer will you know, most likely do one pass, but maybe multiple passes over the code, running some sort of transformation over the code to make it run faster, to make it more memory efficient, um, stuff like that. And then the back end um, does something like instruction selection, register allocation, um, things that might be specific to the target hardware architecture. And Kind of historically, there's been three successful applications of this design. So the, the first one has been the JVM and kind of the .NET architecture, right? So the idea is that if you have anything that can compile to Java bytecode or uh, Microsoft, um, I think it's common uh, in uh, intermediate language, uh, CIL, um, then you can use that kind of whole stack, right? And that's great. But it's not super flexible in the sense that you're stuck to kind of JVM optimizations, JVM garbage collection, all of that sort of stuff. And all of the work for um, supporting all of the different backends and architectures has to be done in, in those tools. So the second kind of successful application of this three-phase design, um, and, and this may be a stretch, but so C has great compilers, right? So you take your code, you take your language, and you transpile it to C, and then you use C compilers. Um, and that is a little hacky and, and maybe not great, but it works, and it's, it's kind of been done a lot in practice. And then the third application is um, closer to, I think, what we're trying to get at is um, GCC. So GCC had, uh, brought the idea of kind of composable um, and pluggable front ends and back ends. And that was important because, I mean, we have, we have a lot of languages that can, can use GCC. And then um, having composable front ends and back ends means that we can kind of plug and play architectures and languages and all of that. In practice, um, useful, but not as a library because it's kind of hard to bring in one part. You have to bring in the entire thing. And there was a lot of leaky abstractions where the front end was talking to some of the back end code and the back end was talking to the front end. So in 2000, um, we had LLVM, a uh, low level virtual machine. It's like, it's, it doesn't really mean anything now. It's just kind of a brand for a whole like, suite of um, compilers, assemblers that are all related. Um, and the, the most important, uh, important part of LLVM was uh, the LLVM intermediate representation, so the IR code. So LLVM IR uh, is, a, is a low level programming language. Um, it's like a reduced instruction set, strongly typed um, language that uh, is very similar to assembly. And all the front ends compile to this LLVM IR. So you have things like um, C, 
C++, Julia, Haskell, Swift, Objective-C, I guess. Um, and they all compile to this LLVM IR. And, and the kind of magic is that the optimizer only acts on this IR code. So why is that so important? It's important because then the optimizations don't have to worry about kind of the language-specific idiosyncrasies, and they don't have to worry about the kind of the target architecture code generation for, for things like ARM um, and AMD64 and all of that sort of stuff. And so I guess this is a DockerCon, so we, we also have to talk about Docker um, and BuildKit, right? Uh, so this is, you know, this is, this is what Docker build looks like, right? This is like fast forward to 2013. This is straight from the readme of Docker 0 0.1. And this is how you build a container, right? So you pull the base, you save the container reference, right? You, you, you run some code, you, you commit it, you tag it, you push it. And at some point, I think this was getting too tedious. So we say, OK, like, we'll, we'll, have, we'll stick this in kind of an imperative uh, config. And uh, this will just, just kind of run all of this stuff, but make it a lot easier. And we'll add some commands to do it. So the Docker file was introduced. Um, I think it was in April 2013. Uh, I tried to do some git blame uh, history and you know, look at all the GitHub issues and, and stuff. And, um, there are three instructions, uh, from, insert, and run, uh, not to be confused with stop, drop, and roll, um, which is what you'll want to do because writing a Docker file is very painful. Um, and then, so the syntax kind of grew um, the next two years. It was frozen in 2015. All the issues closed. We're not accepting any new syntax. It was unfrozen in 2016 with the health check and shell commands. Uh, and then we didn't really get a huge optimization until 2017 when um, the, the great folks at Docker, many of them in the room, implemented multi-stage builds, which was great for caching and optimization. It allowed you to separate your build time and your runtime dependencies so you had smaller, more secure images. Um, but still, Docker files were kind of notoriously hard to write and to optimize. And so this is just, this is just uh, while, while I was doing some research, I found all of the community proposed syntax um, for Dockerfile. Um, unfortunately, I don't think any of these made it in. Uh, but we have some very interesting ones. Uh, begin commit, probably from some SQL developer. Um, unvolume to, uh, I guess, match volume. Um, on commit to, to match. On build, I suppose. Um, and, and some kind of obscure ones like add and run, uh, if you just wanted, I guess, one atomic command. Um, and oh, of course, the other important thing, uh, I'm sure you all know that the, the Docker file syntax is in all caps, so it must be shouted, um, uh, which is uh, what you'll also want to do after you write a Docker file. Um, and I'm sure you've probably been to some talks today about, or this week, about optimizing your Docker file, writing better Docker files. Um, right, I feel like I've been doing it for a long time, and it's, it's kind of like a, it's, it's a magic uh, incantation that you need to do. It's like, it's an art. You know, there's, there's, kind of, there's, there's no hard and fast rules, but there's things that you gen generally want to do, and it's kind of different for each project. You have these long multi-line arguments um, separated by slashes. Um, you want to order your multi-stage multi builds in a way um, that kind of optimizes for build time dependencies, runtime dependencies. Um, you want to utilize the cache from flag, or, or maybe not so much. I guess there, there were a lot of problems with it, as we heard. Um, you want to install your dependencies first, and then copy over the source. Um, you, there are special apt-get flags that you need to use to, to kind of reduce the size and make sure you don't install extra stuff. And of course, you have to find the perfect base image to use. Um, well, that's, that's, that's pretty difficult. So what I, I want you guys to, to think about here is Docker as a compiler. And if any of you were at KubeCon um, not too long ago, um, Galsi Hightower got on stage and um, showed that you can use Docker and you can use all the kind of serverless offerings to, to act as your Fortran compiler, right? And that was interesting, but I, I want to take it a lot further. And I feel like we've, we've already 
taken a lot further. And, and so BuildKit defines this intermediate representation. And, and they call it the low-level build LLB. And LLB is to the Docker file as LLVM IR is to C, or Haskell, or Fortran, or any of the other languages that compile to it. And why that's so important and why I gave that history of uh, th that crash course in, in compilers is because it will help, in, like, once you start to think of Docker as a compiler, it instantly opens up all these other workflows that you hadn't thought of before. And you could even think of the three-phase compiler design in Docker, right? The front end is the Docker file, which compiles to, in BuildKit, this LLB, which is this representation of the build, copy operations, run operations, which is then optimized um, by all of the caching infrastructure of BuildKit. And then the back end, you could think of it as maybe container D, you could think of, of it as the BuildKit daemon. Um, there, there's a few ways to think of the back end, but the idea is this is what will actually um, prepare your image for the target architecture. And if you look at the, the BuildKit readme, you can even see kind of common, um, common phrasing that you, know, you might expect in, in a description of a compiler. Automatic garbage collection, efficient instruction caching, multiple output formats, um, and concur concurrent dependency resolution. So now, now that you're thinking of this, maybe you're a little more motivated to think of, OK, I, I kind of understand what a front end now. Uh, what a front end is. Um, I understand maybe why I might want to implement it, but I want to show you how easy it is to do it. So this is where the code lives, um, R2D4 mocker file on GitHub. Um, I'll, I'll send a link out or I'll tweet a link out later um, if you miss it. But all the code's in this repo. It's, it's not that much um, code, but I'll, I'll walk through it a little bit right now. Is the size good for everyone? Yeah, it looks pretty big. So what I have here is, um, let me just go through kind of the, um, the organization of this repo. There's, on, there's only a, a few things. Um, it's written in Go, um, which is, is probably, I, I guess it, I shouldn't say it's the only way to generate LLB right now, but it's definitely the easiest way to do it. Um, of course, I'm sure other language bindings will, will show up in the future. But for now, Go is the easiest. Um, we have some, uh, th the main part of this will be um, implementing this, uh, this build function here, um, which is uh, needed by this gRPC server that's actually gonna do all the building and implement uh, all of the, the build kit stuff. And, and this is kind of the end product here. So this is just a very prototype basic way to generate an image. I did it in YAML because, of course, we would love to write more YAML. Um, the idea behind this is that it's mostly syntactic sugar around um, building an Ubuntu image. Um, so we have a list of uh, packages here that we want to install. We have um, GPG keys and um, extra repos. Uh, um, so Docker, and, and we're installing Bazel in this as well. And then we have some, uh, I, I call them external files here. I stole the terminology from, from Bazel um, of just binaries that we would like to insert into our, to download and insert into our image. So th there's some code right here that is just basically reading that YAML file and turning it into a config struct. And then the, the most important part here is this kind of mocker file to LLB here. So we're going to walk through a little bit how we take this config and turn it, to, uh, turn it into this LLB state object, which is then we're going to serialize and we'll send it to the, the built kit daemon and have it built and everything. So this code, like, there's really not that much going on. I'll, I'll walk through. You, you can see that, actually, it, it'll help if I um, look at the actual graph. So this is, 
This is a graph of the LLB generated by a multi-stage Docker file. Um, so you can see we have our base image here. And then it does apt-get, um, install some packages, it installs kube control, it installs Helm, the Google SDK, customize some other things. And then we have our second stage here. Sorry for all the zooming. Um, where it actually builds um, the, this binary for this project. And you can see this, this Docker file from kind of 5,000 feet here. Even though it's multi-stage and there'll, there'll be some caching here, it's very linear, right? And, and what we'd like to accomplish with an alternative front end is, of course, new syntactic sugar, um, new features, but making this graph as parallel as possible as parallel as the things inside of it can be, right? Because we don't need to install all of our binaries sequentially. So let me, before I walk through more of the code, let me just show you what the same graph looks like for um, something that I converted to the, the Mockerfile format. And so BuildKit provides all of the, um, all of the, the tools in build control, there's, um, there's a command uh, to dump the LLB, and you can also convert it to um, the, the graphviz dot format, which you're, which you're looking at right here. Um, so that's, that's all included. Um, you can see already this graph is much more complex, right? Even though it's the same thing, it, you can see that um, uh, a, a daemon like BuildKit, which can, knows how to run these things in parallel, can really optimize this graph much more than it can do the previous graph. Um, so you can see, let's see. There are some copies going on here. Um, we start off with Alpine over here. We start off with Ubuntu over here. These things will run in parallel. The Alpine image is actually used to download all of the binaries kind of separately. And then those are stuck back into the resulting container um, in, in this kind of final step over here. So if you want to see that in action, you can see. So this is, this is the, the copy function. So this, this is actually some, some old code. I, I know in the, the, the most current version of BuildKit, there's actually an operation to, to do this so you don't have to use this copy container to actually move your files from, from one part of the graph to the other. So this is, this is optimized now. This function right here, external, is responsible for actually downloading uh, the binaries um, using the Alpine container and then copying them back over into the, the main graph. So you can see that there's really not, there, there's really not too much going on here. I have, um, I have a helper run command here. Um, that's not the right one. But you, you can see that you can, you, you can run these commands. You can, this is almost like the Docker file, but in code. And we're building this, this state object. And we're occasionally calling root so that we're, we're basically building this DAG in code and from our YAML config. And then the result is that uh, you can just Docker build something like this. And then if I wanted to go and say, I want to add a new package here, It would build that. It's, it's cached most of the commands, not the, the huge apt-get command. But this would install the package. Another kind of nice feature that I, I implemented here, uh, you can see in the, each, the list of binaries that are installed, I have um, a checksum that will be verified against the image. And this is done. In, in a very kind of uh, basic way. Uh, 
for when I'm generating the graph, I just add another instruction after the binary has been downloaded um, to, to run uh, the SHA-256 sum uh, binary in the container to, to match against the provided value. And if that fails, the container build will also fail. So that gives you the effect of um, the kind of error checking part of the compiler. And you can see that we, the, the computed checksums did not match, so we'll change it back to the correct one, and it should go through. And so the idea is that it's not to show that like this is a good format for building images, uh, but it's, it just shows how easy it is to extend uh, the, the build kit framework to support things other than the Docker file. And so that code is all in this, this repo, um, so you can please check that out. And then just some other ideas that I, I was thinking about as I was implementing this mocker file and, and thinking about BuildKit. The, the first one being merge strategies. So right now, you can build this very intricate graph with many different paths, right? And maybe you could do something where you push an image for each path and then you just return at the end. But ideally, you'd like to create one Docker image. And the only way to, do, to, to merge right now, to merge two graphs, is to copy some files over from one to the other. And that's great when you know what your outputs are. But in many cases, we don't know exactly what our outputs will be for each layer. So thinking of ways to, to merge two different file systems, I know it sounds a little silly, but I mean, we do it all the time in Git. We have some sort of history. I think that in the future, like, we'll find out a great way to do this. In the worst case, we'll figure out how to do it for packages. So the apt git graph can be done in parallel. It can all be cached. So when you install one package, it can cache it in a way that only um, downloads the kind of the new dependencies if they require like common libraries or, or something like that. Two-step LLB generation. So what I mean by this is you can generate the LLB from the config, but you also get the kind of special feature that the LLB is generated in a container as well. So how we, how we specified that, and I glossed over a little bit, and how Docker knows how to build this, is you put this little syntax helper at the top of your config. So hashtag syntax equals, and then this is a Docker image reference. So this is an image that I pushed with the binary that I, I showed you. And what BuildKit will do is pull this image and then defer to that image for actually building, um, constructing your LLB, and then solving it. So the idea is that you can have dependencies in here that actually do some, an extra step of resolution from your inputs before it generates the LLB and, and before it uh, actually uh, builds the image. Optimization functions on the LLB. So the idea behind this is that we already have great caching uh, from the build kit daemon, but I think there's probably more we can do, especially for the kind of upstream Docker file syntax. Of we have all these rules of if you're doing this, you should optimize it like this, you should write your Docker file like this. I think there there might be some cases where we're able to do that automatically at the build kit or the daemon level. Uh, a digraph friendly front end language. So YAML is uh, not a great language to describe a graph in. Uh, I mean, so is a Docker file. Uh, so I don't, I don't know which one's, which one's better. Uh, they're both pretty bad. There are languages that are made specifically like this. So, and there are many ways to, uh, to represent a graph which would easily be converted to LLB in either a language, a DSL, something like that. One, one that comes to mind that we already have is a makefile. A makefile actually generates a DAG as well. So if we're able to leverage that to, to generate uh, the graph for the LLB and thus build kit, I think that might be very interesting to 
uh, to explore. And I explored that a little bit. I, I wasn't able to get that far, but I, I think there's, there's definitely something there. Um, output layering optimizations. Uh, a lot of times we might not want a layer per instruction, right? And there's ways around this with multi-stage builds, but I think there's a much easier way, uh, you know, maybe a squash directive. I, I know that exists in some places. Um, or, or ways to kind of squash those images so that in, in, in the way that you want, so that you end up with an image that has uh, a sensible, cache-efficient uh, layer. Um, new upstream experimental syntax for the Docker file. Uh, so this is already being done. Uh, the, I think the team here has used uh, the alternative front ends as a way to try out new syntax for the Docker file, and I think that's a great way to um, to gradually introduce syntax, get feedback on it without actually changing um, real kind of upstream Dockerfile code. The one thing I will say here is it would be nice if there was a way to discover uh, a spec for a build kit image. So if I have something like R2D4 mocker file, there's really no way for me to tell what kind of spec this, uh, this assumes. So if there was a way to discover that, I think that would be very interesting as well. Um, so for a Docker file image, what instructions does it actually support? And then the last one, um, I think you'll hear about it a little bit in the next talk, is how does all of this translate to Kubernetes, right? Um, a lot of people are using Kubernetes. I know I think about Kubernetes a lot. Can we improve the UX for leverage, leveraging Kubernetes for builds, for rootless, uh, or even having the, uh, the front-end framework, the, the, the front-end uh, configuration be a Kubernetes resource itself that can be managed by etcd and, and the whole system. So that's just some thoughts on BuildKit and some front-ends. Um, hopefully, you can look at the code and implement it pretty easily. Um, it's, it's not that hard to do, and I think that you'll have some great ideas of uh, how to improve on the Docker file syntax. So, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, this is really cool. Uh, you can check out, uh, what was the GitHub? Uh, R2D4 mocker file. R2D4 mocker file. And the cool thing is that it works already with existing Docker installations uh, if you enable BuildKit. Um, thank you, Matt. Akihiro, if you want to come on stage and... Uh, Get your, maybe if, um, while Akihiro gets set up, if you have maybe one question that Matt could take. Yeah, sure. Do, do you have any questions in the room? Well, otherwise, you, you, can, you, can, uh, you, you can ask questions. Oh, there's one question yeah. here. Matt, are you still yeah. mic'd up? And here's the mic. What was the main driver behind, behind the project? So the, the question is why? Yeah, yeah great, really great question. Cool not any of the stuff that I was working on at Google. Um, I was honestly just genuinely curious about BuildKit. Uh, I've worked on some similar projects, um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with Canico from, from Google. Uh, I launched that at KubeCon last year, and so that was almost like the flip idea of you have the front end, which is a Docker file, and then you implement new optimizers and new backends. Of course, that's not great because as the Dockerfile syntax changes and there's no real spec, it doesn't really work out that well, right? Because you have subtle differences between upstream Dockerfile, this Dockerfile implementation. Um, and, you know, I've been playing around with build systems a lot, build a, all of that sort of stuff. But I think BuildKit is really the future of if we could just build on top of it, then I think the whole ecosystem will thrive a lot more. So that's why I'm excited about it. And I'll be around afterwards too. Uh, you... Yeah, maybe a last last question. Otherwise, we'll, if if you have questions in mind, then you can write them down, and we can have them at the end. But while Akihiro gets set up, I'll I'll walk to you. Uh, my question was just when you were working on Mockerfile, you said that you were using Go, and that uh, that right now that's pretty much the only language available for that. Um, Go is kind of a neat language, but one of the things that it's not great at is talking about language. So you're not able to really describe 
some of the things that I would expect you'd want to. Uh, was that an issue for you at all, or does that make sense? I'm asking, uh, was Go itself at all an impediment to some of the things you wanted to implement? Um, I would say no. I think generating a graph in code kind of imperatively is always difficult, and I think there's, you know, there's probably better ways to do that, maybe with functional languages. Um, I'm most familiar with Go, so I think that was easy, uh, and it was great to have all of the the resources and use BuildKit as a library to actually build the LLB and everything like that. So I think in the future, like, yeah, it might be really cool to define um, LLB in, in Python and build the graph that way or build it through a config file or bash even, right? Um, but it, it was pretty easy to do. And, and, and Docker, having everything, all the, the commands run containerized really kind of makes that a null point after a certain point. Yeah, yeah. please write Python and uh, all kinds of language bindings for LLB. We'll welcome all, the, all of that. Thank you, Matt. And uh, we'll, we'll give it, um, Akihiro Asuda will give a talk about deploying rootless build kit on Kubernetes. So please give it up to Akihiro. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, and thanks for coming to my session. Uh, I'm Akihiro Seda, I'm a software engineer at Entity Corporation. I'm a maintainer of uh, Mobile Continuity and BuildKit. I'm also uh, organizing uh, Docker meetups in Tokyo as a community leader. Uh, so uh, the first, uh, the rootless uh, mode uh, refers to running a BuildKit daemon as a non root user. Uh, so uh, we can protect the host from uh, potential BuildKit vulnerability I suppose uh, BuildKit is uh, already uh, safe, so you don't need to uh, worry too much, uh, but potentially it may have uh, some bug that results in continuous breakout. Uh, but uh, we run uh, the daemon as a different user, uh, so the root user on the host is uh, protected. And actually, uh, we can also run the entire Docker daemon as a uh, non-root user, but in this talk, uh, I focus on a standard BuildKit daemon, as, so, uh, actually, I uh, already uh, gave a talk about uh, running uh, Docker daemon uh, with rootless mode uh, yesterday, uh, so you can, uh, you can uh, find a slide deck on this URL. And actually, uh, probably the movie will be also published. And uh, the rootless uh, mode is uh, typically very useful for deploying a build to Kubernetes. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, useful for CI or CD pipeline. Uh, so you have uh, some ports in the cluster. And another port uh, builds your application by connecting uh, build to the service in the Kubernetes cluster. And also uh, running uh, build kit in Kubernetes is also useful for migrating uh, your workload uh, from laptop to the cluster. Uh, so typically, uh, you have very poor CPU on your laptop, uh, so compi compiling uh, your application takes a lot of time. And your network is uh, probably flaky. Uh, but uh, if uh, you move your workload to a Kubernetes cluster, uh, you can have a rich CPU and also a rich network, uh, so you can uh, quick build your application. And on laptop, uh, you, are, you don't uh, have uh, power supply, so your bat you don't want to uh, consume your battery uh, while compiling your program. Uh, so uh, you can uh, migrate your workload to uh, the cluster so you can save your battery. And uh, running a build kit in Kubernetes uh, doesn't require setting security conditions to those privileges to true. Uh, this is a Kubernetes equivalent of uh, Docker and that's just privileged. Also, uh, you don't need to bind mount any API socket such as uh, slash bar slash run slash docker.soc or uh, buildkit.d.soc. Uh, but there was a myth uh, that uh, rootless buildkit requires security context privileged. Actually, this was true in the uh, previous version, but uh, since built it, uh, uh, version 0 0.4, uh, you don't need uh, this security condition privilege to flag. Uh, but uh, you 
Instead, you need to uh, disable process sandbox. Uh, this is a bilged bingo uh, that mean uh, unsharing a PID namespace and uh, mounting a proc FS. Uh, so you need to run build a daemon with a dash dash or share dash worker dash no dash process dash sandbox. Uh, so uh, you don't have a process sandbox around the worker container. I mean a container used for uh, running Docker file instruction, such as uh, run gcc blah, 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 dot c or run up to date blah, blah, blah. Uh, so that means a uh, worker container can potentially kill uh, the build daemon. Uh, but we still have a process sandbox for the build kit daemon. Uh, so the worker container uh, cannot uh, kill the process in the host. And uh, as uh, we don't have process sandbox for worker container, uh, potentially worker container can trick the daemon uh, with PTOS. But you don't need to worry because uh, we have SecComp and also we have uh, Yama in most of these stores. Uh, so the uh, PTOS is uh, prohibited in most environments. And if uh, you want to enable process sandbox so that a worker container cannot kill the daemon, uh, you can uh, use security proc mount uh, flag for supporting process sandbox. Uh, this flag uh, requires a recent version of Kubernetes or, and, and Docker or ContainerD as a serial runtime. And there was uh, also another myth that SecComp uh, and Upper Armor needs to be uh, disabled. Uh, currently, uh, this is uh, not a myth. But uh, currently, on default Kubernetes, SecComp and Upper Armor are anyway uh, disabled. Uh, because in Kubernetes world, uh, SecComp is uh, still in alpha status, and Upama is in beta status. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, you can run rootless build kit uh, with default Kubernetes. Uh, so uh, we don't have a SecComp sandbox for the daemon, but we can still enable SecComp for uh, worker containers. Uh, so uh, worker container uh, cannot uh, Call uh, malicious system calls against the host. Uh, but uh, we have a plan to uh, support running rootless build kit with uh, SecComp and Aprama. The idea is uh, put a build kit daemon is a uh, gvisor, and put a gvisor is a runcy container uh, with SecComp and Aprama enabled. Uh, gvisor is uh, yet another Linux kernel implementation, uh, but in user space. Uh, this is implemented by Google. Uh, so a uh, gvisor uh, emulates uh, system calls uh, using uh, PTORES. Uh, so you don't need to uh, disable SecComp and upper armor. Uh, if you are using uh, old version of Docker and Linux kernel, uh, you need to uh, allow capsize PTORES capability. But if you are using uh, latest version of Docker and kernel, uh, you don't need such capability. And GVisor is also uh, attractive uh, because uh, we can mitigate uh, potential vulnerability in kernel because GVisor intercepts all the system calls. Uh, but currently running build kit on GVisor fails with uh, some error code uh, because uh, GVisor uh, re-implements uh, Linux kernel uh, from scratch, but it has uh, some incompatibility or well, another idea is to uh, use uh, user mode Linux. Uh, this is a project uh, very similar to GVisor, but it's already uh, 20 years old. And user mode Linux is uh, based on real Linux source code. It's not written from scratch. Uh, so it has uh, full compatibility with uh, real Linux kernel. Uh, the user mode Linux is uh, kind of like uh, being forgotten recent years, uh, but it's still alive and maintained in the upstream kernel tree. And uh, when I refer to running uh, uh, build kit as a rootless, uh, some of you uh, might come up with uh, Kaniko. Uh, Kaniko is a Google's project. And Kaniko is, is uh, somewhat similar to build kit, but uh, it's still uh, 
root for, uh, so the Kaniko needs to be executed as the root. Uh, but Kaniko is unprivileged, so you don't need to disable secomp and abama. So uh, Kaniko uh, might be able to mitigate some vulnerabilities that the build kit cannot mitigate. Uh, for example, uh, if there was a vulnerability in some system call, uh, Kaniko can protect your host. But uh, vice versa, uh, so uh, build kit might be able to also mitigate some vulnerabilities that Kaniko cannot mitigate. Uh, for example, if uh, there is a vulnerability in Rancy uh, that result in container breakout, uh, Kaniko is likely to be vulnerable as well. Uh, but if you're using a build kit, uh, the build kit is running as another user, uh, so the host can be protected. And there's uh, another miss, uh, so that uh, overlay FS cannot be used. Uh, actually, this is true on, on Banyar kernel, but if you're using uh, Ubuntu kernel, uh, overlay FS can be used. So currently, I suggest using uh, Ubuntu nodes in your cluster. Ubuntu nodes is available in all major Kubernetes distributions, such as GKE or AKS or EKS. And we are also planning to uh, support uh, Fuse Overlay FS. Uh, it's uh, another implementation of Overlay FS, but in user space. And you can use uh, Fuse Overlay FS uh, with any Linux distribution, but, but you need to use a recent version of kernel, uh, 4.18 or 4.19. Or uh, even if you can't use Overlay FS, you can still use XFS uh, with support for data application. Uh, so if you uh, format the file system uh, with MKFS, XFS, dash M reference equal one, uh, you can enable uh, data application of files. Uh, this is slow, but uh, it can be uh, good to work around. Uh, the next is demo. Uh, so the, uh, the Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, for Kubernetes, uh, we can just use kubectl run. You don't need to write uh, YAML files. Also, you don't need to uh, create Kubernetes service uh, because uh, buildctl can directly connect buildctl daemon running in the cluster. Uh, this, is implemented in, uh, but this is implemented by using kubectl exec. But of course, you can also use uh, Kubernetes service. And we are also planning to uh, bring Kubernetes support in Docker build X. Uh, so the, this is uh, very useful for compose build and multi-platform images. Uh, so in the cluster, I have a pot of a build kit named BK. And my username is user. Uh, with UID 1000, and I'm running uh, build the demo as this user. And I have a Docker file uh, like this. So we have Debian as a base image and install Sysway uh, banner and create some uh, banner file using this command. and build uh, using uh, build kit host equal cube dash pot slash slash bk and execute the build ctl command. works. And we also, uh, uh, thanks. And we also uh, have support for a K-native build. So a K-native uh, build is a common CRD interface for a bunch of uh, container image builders, such as uh, Bazel or Red Hat Builder and BuildKit and also uh, build packs, Jib, Kaniko, Matisse, and also other several builders. 
so you can uh, build, build uh, image using a YAML file like this. Uh, so uh, in the YAML, uh, you specify the path of your Git repository in, in uh, this YAML, uh, spec source Git URL. And you specify the uh, name of the image of the registry as arguments. And also you need to specify the uh, build the plugin as a template dot name. And uh, currently build it uh, runs as a demo, but if you don't like having a demo, uh, you can also use uh, image, IMG. Uh, this is uh, based on build it, but it doesn't have demo. Uh, the uh, features and restriction of uh, image is almost the same as uh, build it. Uh, that's all, all of my talk. Any questions? Hello. Thank you. So let's give uh, let's give some time for questions for Akihiro, uh, or or Matt or Tonis. Uh, you guys can come up on stage if you want. Um, how much time do we have left for this session? Fifteen minutes. All right. So this can be like very informal, casual. Just raise your hand and a. Uh, I didn't see very well. Any questions? Any comments? Any any feedback? All right. One question. All right. If you don't have any questions, uh, you can tweet or just come up on one on ones. All right. All right, for Tonus, when we do the multi-node build support and we build um, potentially different architectures in our environment, is it possible to have a collection of three or four different nodes that are all building um, regular Intel 64 and have that pick the least used out of that collection? So from the early on, we did have like uh, designed to do like fully distributed builds with BuildKit. So what you see in BuildX at the moment, it's uh, only for different platforms. So we can uh, split your workflow up by the platform. And then, uh, but still, like for every platform, your build will only go to one node. So you can, even if you specify, if you, even if you add like three x86 nodes under one builder, if you're building for x86, it, they will all go to the first one, basically. Any more questions? No. Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, we can take questions from here, one one as well.